Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the art of the exit strategies for maximizing your business's appeal to buyers hosted on behalf of Deal Leaders International, a professional sell side mergers and acquisitions advisory. My name is Shannon Derehove and I'll be assisting the speakers in today's session. Before we get started, please note the chat and the Q&A are available to you. Please post your questions in the Q&A and your comments in the chat. Both the Q&A and the chat are at the bottom of your screen. Please also be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you when it's available. We are also streaming live on our YouTube channel. We'll share the link as soon as it's available. Today's panel will explore effective strategies for enhancing the value of your in engineering or mining services business, including optimizing operations, diversifying service offerings, and improving financial transparency. The webinar will provide actionable insights for business owners aiming to attract local and international buyers or investors. Today's session will be facilitated by financial journalist and broadcaster, Michael Avery. He'll be in discussion with Deal Leaders International's CEOs, Rick Grantham from Midmarket and Andrew Bowman from Corporate and Advisory. So without further ado, I'll hand over now to Michael to start the discussion. Fantastic, Shannon. Thank you very much. And wonderful to be with you all today on uh, a momentous day. I think we can all agree. Uh, many of us have probably peeled our eyes away from the American election to uh, join this webinar on the art of the exit. So no, we're not going to be talking about Kamala Harris. If you're talking about exit strategies, I think there's going to be a lot of navel gazing amongst uh, the Democrats. Uh, but if you're a business owner eyeing a future exit, you've certainly come to the right place. And I think, and I was uh, joking, uh, slightly tongue in cheek, but maybe slightly seriously earlier, um, that uh, we're probably entering the age of the deal maker again. If you just look at how transactional Donald Trump is, but we also know, as the Economist uh, has said in its headline today, probably a new world disorder because it can be quite a, a chaotic uh, process under his leadership. So what we're going to talk about is if you're an entrepreneur, how do you ensure that your exit isn't a chaotic process? How do you plan ahead? And how do you ensure that you get the best possible outcome? Because frankly, you've spent your entire life building this business, uh, building it to, to scale and ultimately to sale, to exit. So today's discussion is really designed to tackle some of those big challenges and opportunities that are emerging in a world that is clearly changing. I mean, as we speak underneath our feet, uh, everyone is, is trying to um, make uh, sense of what's happened in the US. I'm here in Dublin. It's just remarkable um, how many here in Dublin are shocked and disappointed. Uh, they're, they're very uh, strong supporters, it seems, over here, even on the talk radio of uh, one particular party over in the US. Uh, but more than that, speaking to Dubliners, when you shared that you're from South Africa, a lot of them turn to the mining story and um, and interestingly are saying, oh, you know, where are the opportunities? So I think, you know, increasingly we are playing in a globalized world uh, where all of these opportunities uh, emerge. Now, um, I did have a look at uh, what the market is doing, and I, and I had to just preface this before I introduce uh, Rick and Andrew. Uh, U.S. stock futures up between one and a half and two percent. Bitcoin has gained over eight percent. Oil prices slightly lower, and the dollar surging. But the big one for me is the ten-year bond yield. That's above four point four percent. So I think the market is uh, telling you that it is worried about uh, Trump. It's worried about tariffs. That's certainly not necessarily good news for us here in uh, in South Africa. But I just want to leave you with this thought as we dive in. We are going to be, as South Africa, hosting uh, the presidency of the G20 next year, and we are going to be succeeding the US, uh, which recently held the presidency of the G20. So it'll be very interesting to see how we use that potentially to our advantage. But let's just start by introducing our speakers today. First up, Rick Grantham is CEO, um, as Sh Shannon said, of DLI's um, uh, mid-market division. He's a qualified mechanical engineer with an MBA. Uh, so he's grown and sold his own businesses as well as uh, advising others on how to do the, the, the hard yards um, from an advisory perspective. So it's a very unique thing that having an entrepreneur then going into advisory, he's dealt with everything, underground mining equipment to industrial solutions. So he certainly knows what's under the hood. 
And um, joining him is Andrew Bowman, CEO of Corporate and Advisory at DLI, who's a, a CA, Chartered Accountant, uh, with years of experience guiding businesses through equity transactions. He's a, a regular guest on my show. And um, it's always a great pleasure having Andrew on because he, he's got a great way of demystifying some of the process and the procedure. He's probably advised on more business exits than I've had coffee this year. So let's just hear from uh, the pro first maybe rick you can kick us off and just tell us a little bit more about your career so far and some of the deals that that you've advised on the more recently great thanks michael yeah no an honor to be here and um yeah great great to have such a such a diverse and interesting audience um yeah when i say that i'm a mechanical engineer i did actually i studied it and um, i worked as a mechanical engineer for a number of years but i think i'm better at selling businesses um, and that might be because I don't think I was ever a very good mechanical engineer, but certainly it's it's amazing what what experience you know, engineering gives you. I mean, it just you know, it gives you access to so many industries, gives an understanding of how things work, and I think it's been a great great baseline for me um, in terms of what I do now, which I really love and I'm passionate about. And, and maybe just to to kind of help with the, the story, just to, you know, to go into one of our deals we've we've just concluded, um, which is a, a foundry out in the East Rand. And called Primer Foundry, um, and yeah, that was a case where, and you know, it's just it's really nice and relevant because of the international acquirer that we got to the table, but it was just it really showed it's about finding the right acquirer and finding the right deal, um, in a scenario where we really couldn't get much out of the South African market at all, and um, we found a, um, the right buyer was in Chile. When I met the the owners of that of that business, the the, the chairman, I met them, you know, sort of at the celebratory lunch, and their very first question was, "How did you find us?" And um, so, yeah, there's a, there is activity, there's international interest. It's a great place to be. A lot of activity in the engineering, mining services sector. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to sh you know, sharing some stories. Yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer uh, who, who is now applying those same uh, problem solving uh, abilities to helping businesses uh, exit. So I think maybe a little self deprecating there as well, Rick. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, Andrew? Uh, tell us a little bit more about your career in the M&A advisory space. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I pretty got a good blend of in the early days. Look, I did qualify later as a CA, if, if hopefully that counts in my favor to all the guests. Um, but I have got good experience, I think, initially on uh, from a corporate and banking perspective. So I'd been on the buy side uh, on a number of transactions. And then, yeah, the entrepreneurial journey, you know, something similar to Eric has just, you know, fascinated uh, me and and the ability to embark on this I suppose trusted journey. You know, you're dealing with individuals that have built companies over a long period of time, and and yeah, the the ability to find like in that previous deal Rick spoke about, um, find the right buyers. You know, we I go back over the last couple of years, and you know, Sabrin, which is one of the EOH um, tech companies, Heralds, which is a very big um, electrical distribution company. These are all big transactions with um, that were complex. And again, speaking to finding the right buyers, I wish this this, trans, this uh, webinar was happening about six months time because we've got about 2 billion rands worth of two or three really big transactions that I'm currently working on. So hopefully there'll be some some good war stories out of that. But um, yeah, ex exciting and, and always a privilege to work with other entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and it is one of those things that while we live in a world where AI seems to be disrupting everything, it's still a very human process. It's a very high cool. touch process. Um, and and you, need to, you need to work with advisors as entrepreneurs that you can have a chemistry with, that, that you can cool. build a relationship with. And, um, you know, working with partners that have been there in the trenches, done it themselves, built their own businesses, uh, you know, it, 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 it helps build a lot of that chemistry. But I want to find out from the, the delegates, uh, because we want to keep this interactive, please keep your questions coming in the chat function. But uh, let's find out a little bit more about who's actually joined us today. Let's see who's in the room. And we've got a poll um, that we'd uh, like to put up uh, just to get a little bit more insight into who you are with us today. What, what are your top priorities in um, in considering a business sale or, or acquisition? Uh, and that'll uh, probably just give us a better sense of, of who's in the room at the moment as we, um, as we wait for people to vote. Uh, the options are either maximizing valuation, ensuring a cultural fit, uh, maybe you, you, you uh, for whatever reason, need to execute on a transaction speedily. You might just want to minimize your risks and liabilities, or it's for long-term growth and expansion from a strategic perspective. 
So as we're voting, it looks to be uh, the first and the fifth choice is maximizing valuation and long-term growth and expansion seems to be the sweet spot of why the majority are in the room today. Um, uh, I'm glad there was no option just to make a quick buck. Uh, but let's <laughs> let's minimize that poll and we'll come back to it as soon as we've had uh, everyone answer. Well, it looks like we um at almost two-thirds so i think we could probably call it a two-thirds long-term growth and expansion is the primary reason followed by uh maximizing valuation i mean that that's quite interesting rick maybe you can just kick us off and from that perspective because i mean they say that hope isn't a strategy and that's especially true when it comes to m a when business owners come to you without a clear exit plan what's the biggest risk that they face uh and um, when you're advising them how do you help um, frame the strategic necessity to have this this very well thought out process and plan right up front? Sure, you know it is so multifaceted, um, and I think what um, an interesting place to start with that is it isn't all about growth. If people assume it's just well, it's like yeah, I must grow more and then I can sell for more. Um, there's so many other factors in it that 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 play into that. Um, you know, I think that the you know, it, it's the structure of the company. Funny enough, and I, I, I raised this in one of our early seminars many years ago, the, the concept of focus. Um, I had a bit of an embarrassing situation where I started talking about a company that I'd seen recently, and they were really unfocused. And then I suddenly thought they were in the audience. Luckily, they weren't, but it was, it, it, it was, it was a bit of a risky moment. But focus is important. You know, being very, very diversified as a small business doesn't really work. So focus is a, is a, is yeah. a critical element of, of being kind of market ready and, and growing for, you know, as part of a strategy to walk towards an exit. The other fascinating thing, which it's kind of weird how industrial engineering businesses often, you know, they, they pride themselves on the fact that they grow through word of mouth that we've never advertised. Having a marketing strategy, having a sales pipeline management system is massively important in building a sustainable EBITDA rather than a kind of once or fantastic EBITDA. So, you know, those kind of strategies, and particularly, you know, this marketing and sales pipeline one is one that has really become a bit of a mantra of mine at the moment, because particularly when you see people, this is a little bit of a, a movement off the topic, but maybe, maybe it's relevant to many. When people are using, they're, they're finding ways to get money out of the company, pay less tax. Let me see if I can you know, pay my children, pay someone else just to get money out of the company. When, you know, but if you spent that money in the company on marketing, you'd get growth and you would pay less tax but you'd be spending it more wisely. So there's, there's a lot of room to, to, to really think about your company and stop, stop trying to kind of protect it and think this is, this is my lifestyle and this is what I'm going to, you know, it, it's making me money and I'm going to take it out and I'm going to invest it somewhere else. Recognize that this, this is your investment. Invest in it and grow it and, and, and kind of stop priding yourself in many cases on, on how cleverly you're doing it with, you know, kind of on a shoestring. Try investing in your own in your own asset um, and growing it from there. So I think I think that's very much where my my head is at the moment. Obviously, when you talk about the strategy, we do find businesses that are just kind of getting it wrong. Um, and often I do say, just focus on your bottom line, grow that bottom line. You know, stop uh, uh, kind of think, well, I'm just going to be a small company forever. Well, what's it really going to take to get up to that 15 or 20 million EBITDA? Um, I've got a lot of experience selling smaller businesses. It's hard to sell a, a business doing five million of EBITDA. You know, set the targets, grow, go for the for the bottom line growth, and often the bottom line growth is more more in front of you than you realize. And um, there's a one, one of the guys we've done some work with is um, talks about being a profit coach. Look for the profits in your business; they might be closer than you think, rather than thinking you've got to go out and grow the top line to make the profits happen. But I'm, I've, I've got so much to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, Michael. Okay. Can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm sure, you know, even in that process, often um, an entrepreneur may have an exit in mind and then do and, and start the process with you and go through the business to say, you, you know, there, there are factors here that um, mean there's probably still some more value on the table and, and it helps crystallize that value in their own head. And, and they may even then turn around and say, right, actually, I want to stay invested for a little while longer. Maybe tricky for you then as an advisor. But I mean, that's why these, yeah. these, these hygiene factors sometimes, as I call them, are so important. Andrew, from your perspective, and you, you've worked on deals ranging from 100 million to over 300 million, how does having this more strategic approach impact 
your, your valuation, your appeal in these higher value deals and how essential is it for sellers to understand what they want out of a deal before going to market? I think, you know, to all of the above, it's critical, you know, to, I think you, you made the point um, a little earlier, just around most business owners thinking about an exit strategy. Um, yes, and, and a, a robust plan and, and process will allow you to start, start addressing some of those issues. But, you know, what's fundamentally important, I think, as we work with business owners is a thorough understanding of what is the, what does value in the market look like? you know, and, and what will the market pay for and, you know, and the like. So it's the ability to go through that iterative process and be able to join all of those dots with the business owner to try and understand, you know, that in order to do a good deal, like Rick said, it's not about one thing. You know, there's, there's a number of elements that, that, you know, need to be showcased. But I think more importantly, particularly on these larger deals we're seeing more recently, they have to be proven so, you know, there's that great saying, people believe. Hmm. Andrew, uh, I think you're just frozen. Rick, um, you're not frozen, as I can see. Do you, do, you, do you just want to pick up on that point? Yeah, it's, it's, it's always picking up difficult picking up on Andrew's points because he's got a lot to say. But I, I think that, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it is about the, I'm a bit lost on this one, on the, the, the strategy of, of the exit rather than just the strategy of the business. Um, and I think that's where Andrew was going with it, is trying to get into the, so when it comes to an exit, I've got a, actually a, a great example um, of someone who built for a particular acquirer. I think we've all seen the, um, the growth in the, the pet stores around. There's a company called Absolute Pets. And they just made sure that they were, um, they, they were putting their their pet stores close to Woolworths. And sure enough, who who became the acquirer? It was Woolworths who became the acquirer. And because they literally they they strategized their their business around their exit rather than just building a good business. Sorry, Andrew, we we lost you there for a moment. Oh, but yeah. I'm trying to pick up on where you were, but I think it was this idea of the strategy of the exit, not just the strategy of growth. Great, absolutely. Yeah. Apologies, yeah. something happened with the signal. Yeah. And, and I mean, when you look at that, let's let's maybe bring up another poll just to get a better sense of who's in the room. And I'd um, uh, like you to answer as best you can what best describe current focus in the, um, So you've got uh, options of uh, no, it's the the other poll. What um, best times for this? Maybe if we can see, Shannon, if you've got, there we go. Is it selling a business, business owner, um, buying a business, selling others, or supporting the m &A ecosystem, maybe a government or a regional, you know, one of those approaches that uh, uh, Rick uh, referred to earlier. So uh, let me flood in now, and it looks like the majority of you are, are either business owners, entrepreneurs yourself, or, or looking to sell a business at the moment? Well, that's fantastic because really that's um, the, the the meat of what we're talking about today, isn't it, Andrew? Um, maybe you could kick us off on this idea then of what. You We seem to be having a battle for connectivity yeah. in both Ireland and Joburg. Yeah, and crazy. I, I, I think Joburg is having anyway. I'm I'm back here, so uh, maybe we can dive into the six strategies that can make or break an exit, and and you can walk us through the process with some some real examples of the, the deals that you've worked on. And Great. Often they say in M and A, if you don't ask, you you don't get. And and Rick, I suspect that's good advice. Here. Why is passivity risk in the sale process, especially um, when you're talking to entrepreneurs who may be a bit tentative about being more assertive about what they want to get out of the process? What can sellers actively do to to be a bit more active and avoid this? Yeah, I think I think Rick, you're 
Yeah, I think um, I'll pick it up there. I think this, so, so it's a kind of first mantra. We've got, we've got kind of six points we go through and we go through them quite often, but probably the stories change over time. But the first idea is, you know, we so often find people busy with the process of trying to sell and they're just passive about it. Um, mostly because they're most interested in speaking to the party who's shown the most interest over time. I think any decent business, well, I shouldn't say that because there may be others in the room, but a lot of business owners have had, had an approach of some kind before. Someone says, if you ever want to sell, talk to me. I'm, I've, you know, I've got lots of funding. I'm ready to buy. Um, it's not the right place to start. And if you do go down that line, and anyone who's been through this, and I think a lot of people will have, you kind of, great, great start to a process. You know, someone's interested in my business. It feels good. You know, you, you, you kind of feel really honored. Um, but the moment you shake hands and say, cool, I, you know, the, the guy kind of maybe puts a price on the table or you say, my number is X, you go down that road. The moment you shake hands and say, let's go into an exclusivity process, you've handed over control to another party. And unfortunately, you won't really know where this deal is going until the end. And mostly those deals don't go anywhere. Um, and that's because there's so much that you need to understand about deals. And it's very, very seldom about the price. Um, you know, it's, it's about so many other things. And I think the moment you take that passive approach, you're almost forcing yourself into kind of property deal. Property deals in the business world just don't work. There's, there are too many details. There's too, there's too much structure to it. And generally, you know, price structure and legal agreements, warranties, risk, all of those things paint a very different picture. So in the process of being passive, you're basically handing over control to someone else. And chances are it's going to be an ugly road. And chances are you're going to say no before the end of it. Um, so yeah, it's a passive, passivity is certainly the, the biggest killer of deals, and um, because and I, I suppose another sort of mantra about this: deals don't happen on their own. Yeah, you know, they happen through hard work, and they, we'll go through these factors, um, these yeah. the, these other points as we go. So Andrew, just to build on that, I mean, how do you ensure that the seller stays in control without overwhelming any potential buyers? What what are some of the practical steps to avoid the pitfalls of, of being pa passive? Yeah, so it's definitely having a you know a robust plan. I think the starting point is truly understanding you know what the the business owner wants, and then building a plan and a process around that, because I think you know it's it's such a big decision. There's a lot of sensitive information, and it's a huge step that someone has to take place. You know by defining the right approach to market and controlling the flow of information and engagement. You can control the pace at which engagement takes place. You can control the pace at which information is shared, and you can be quite targeted around who you're approaching proactively. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to go into almost the, I suppose, the governance framework around it to make sure that you maintain control. But it's also, you know, giving the business owner a comfort that everything that happens, every strategy, every execution, whatever it may be, um, rests on the decision of the of the seller. You know, it's it's mm. nothing happens without that level of approval. And I guess that's that's where, you know, uh, to the example Rick gave earlier. Um, things can go south if you get a direct approach and then all of a sudden you're on the back foot. That control element is is really, really critical. And it builds on the second point where, where choice is king. Uh, in media, we like to say content is king. I'm not so sure <laughs> under Trump presidency, uh, any media is safe from that anymore even. But but Rick, back to this idea of choice is king. And you mentioned in the mm -hmm. Prima deal that the, the acquirer wanted to know, how did you find us? So maybe you could just share... Um, how this idea of building choice comes into the strategic thinking and the framework process, because I, I hear it's especially important when attracting international buyers. Yeah, it's, and, and it, there's the, the sort of multi levels to it. But I think the, the starting point is at the start, you really don't know who the buyer is going to be. So this idea, and you know, we've challenged ourselves this many times oh, so and so is the buyer. Here's a new client. We, we know who's going to buy this. I reckon 90% of the time we are wrong. In fact, 95% of the time we are wrong. So it, it chances are the party that you thought was the perfect buyer, maybe they, they would on the right day. Maybe last year they were the perfect buyer. Now they're not. Maybe they want an acquisitive strategy then. Now they aren't. Maybe they're going to be next year, but when you need to talk to them, they aren't. So it means that you've got to, you've got to cast the net really wide. I mean, in that particular case of Primer, I think you know, besides all the other parties that we spoke to, there are about 10 or 15 multinational companies doing fairly similar kind of work that we spoke to. Only one was interested. 
The others weren't interested. It was not like they came to the table and we got them outbid or something. They were not interested. But we couldn't have predicted that at the start. So choice means spreading it wide. In, in our ideal world, we would like to see three or four or even five offers per deal we take to market. In that case, we kind of had one and a half. The other party wasn't that interested. They were kind of, you know, felt like they'd, they'd take a chance. But you can't get multiple yeah. offers, you know, from speaking to one or two people. Generally, we get three or four, four or five offers by speaking to 100 people and narrowing it down. So that you get choice by casting wide and being very strategic about who you're speaking to. Rick, I just want to follow up on that. Is there a risk, though, that, I mean, if so they, you know, options are your best insurance policy, you get a range of buyers, but that um, the, the buyer might feel like, oh, I'm now in an auction process and I'm just, you know, the price mm. is being bid higher. Uh, so Good how question. does one kind of sh- straddle that, that, that potential risk? So part of it is trust. Yeah, so I think certainly in our case, we've spoken to a lot of buyers over a long time and we understand them, how to manage that because you can't, they've got to trust us when we say, we are going to speak to you about your deal and your offer for this business. We are not going to, we, we, we make it quite clear up front, this is not an auction process. It's not a, like a tender process where we open all, the, open all the envelopes at 12 o'clock on Friday and see which one's the biggest. Each one, and so often price, we expect, yeah, I reckon in a good more than 50% of cases, the highest price is not the winning bid. The, the best deal is the winner. Um, and that's got many, many facets to it. So I think once you've, yeah, so so I think that the the, the buyers who, who we work with, we spend a lot of time giving them that comfort. We actually got an offer um, on last Thursday for a technology business that we'd taken to market. And it's not quite right. It's got a, a and it, it's kind of average from a from a, a value point of view, um, and there's a structural element. Twenty five percent is on an earnout, and we are very anti earnouts. We find they they just deliver the wrong kind of behaviour um, post transaction, and um, the so we we had a session with with a buyer yesterday afternoon, and it was amazing how grateful they were that we weren't just saying sorry, but no good. We were engaged with them, and we said this is why we don't think this works. By the way, your 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 price is reasonable. We think there's more out there. And so we're just going to put your, your offer aside for, for now. But if you want to improve it, here's some thoughts on how you could do that. So we engage with them. And I think that build, that building of trust that we are, we're helping them get to the right deal makes them not feel like they're just in an auction process. Um, it, it is about finding the best possible deal for this party. And generally, the best, best, the best buyer results in the best deal, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, Andrew, maybe you could just build on that in terms of, you know, the impact that having multiple offers can have on the final terms of, mm. of the transaction when, when you get to that stage. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting because I think, you know, when you do analyze those offers, um, they're all very different, you know, so there's a value, there's a structure, there's the the strategic and cultural fit, you know, and, you know, and, and the like. So, yeah, it, it can be quite overwhelming. I think, you know, when when you you look at all of these elements as a business owner and it's, all that information needs to be analyzed and distilled, I guess, into one hymn sheet. So you're comparing apples, apples with apples. Um, but but what's key about it is, you know, it's it's which one is going to have the highest probability of success. And then, you know, you've got to look at other elements like the pedigree of the buyer. Have they got the funding? How many deals have they done? You know, either, what is the execution risk? So, so there's so many layers to this, but it does help having options. You know, and and the the the, I think a lot of the time we see it, and I've seen it recently, where it opens a you know a business owner's eyes to realize, well, there's there's lots to this, and there's very different types of partners out there, and that choice element and multiple offers, yes, it can help the value. Um, but it but it goes three or four levels deeper, which at the end of the day feed you know hopefully a good uh, and successful transaction. Uh, What's it, fascinating it, it, there, Michael, is, is how we yeah. sorry to 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 butt in there. But we no, please do. when we were less experienced, we found that um, there was a lot of arm wrestling going on. We'd get low ball offers, we'd have to go negotiate them up. We've done very very little of that lately because we're getting great offers first time because people trust the process. They're not trying to play. They're not not gaming it. They're trusting the process. They're putting in great offers first time, and that's when you get you know the, an example. That, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal your thunder, Andrew. But just recently, we had you know two offers came in on a business on the same day. The one was for 225 million. The second one, same day, same business, same information, was 450. I mean, it's, that's that's a you know two times 
you know, between the, the lowest and the highest. And that's because, you know, they both, and I believe they both put in their best offers. It wasn't like one was trying to low pull. They just had different strategies. And, yeah. and that's, yeah. That's well, it, it, exactly. And, you know, depending on what that strategy is, that that uh, just over 400 million could, could be well worth it. If you look at the kinds of synergies that might go into that acquirer, um, versus the other offer that you had on the table. That, that's why I think understanding the acquirer, understanding the buyer and the market, and to your point, the time uh, and the timing of the deal is so critical. It boils down to preparation, though, if you look at it, um, Andrew. They say that by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So mm. what are some areas that sellers often overlook during the preparation phase? Mm. Yeah, look... It's it's probably one of those those aha moments that we've had over the last couple of years, and you know we often say it'd be great to get to some of our clients a little bit earlier, but most of the time it's the not so sexy stuff that that you know needs to be focused on. And one thing you can rest assured of is most of it is is underpinned by information and data. So you know, and a, a robust financial reporting system, good governance systems, and compliance. And we're not talking at a listed level; just strong um, records and audit trails and physical evidence that that can be looked at. And the preparation has to be separated. One is on the business, and obviously, there's there's you almost look at it from a due, like like a due diligence. There's financial, legal, human capital, environmental, all of those things. And then there's also the preparation from a mindset perspective with a business owner, because it, it it is a daunting process. It is a emotional roller coaster. So so it's also managing both of those to one get a good view of what it's how it's going to play out, uh, clearly be supported along the way. Um, but but all the all the preparation that gets done, if you can get hold of almost a generic due diligence list, um, most of the time it will scare someone. But there's elements in there that you know, will will probably represent a, 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 the fundamental basics that need to be covered. Um, and, and you know, to Rick's earlier point around the EBITDA and the profitability, um, the ability to prove it, it sounds so random and obvious, but you're going to be, you know, asking someone to, to cut a big check, hopefully, they're going to need to be able to do that. So the more time you invest in preparation, typically the more successful the transaction is going to be. Um, and that's that's I'm, I just beca it's become a rule of thumb. And uh, Rick, just to prepare one as an entrepreneur for that journey for the process, how how early on uh, in the process does one start preparing? In other words, if I'm sitting and I'm 55 and I think, right, I've probably got another five years, and I've always had 60 years the retirement age, and you know, is now the time to start preparing for an exit in five years' time? Do do I start doing that at 67? Is there a rule of thumb for this? Is it market dependent? You know, when it comes to preparation, I suppose the best time to start was yesterday and the next best time today. So there the, are the, the, the two different types of preparation, I think, that one's covering. I think your business, chances are it's ready today. In other words, how much can you do to change your business is, is always a question. So... Yes, as we said earlier, if it's a real mess, tidy it up. If it's not focused, get it focused. Get those things in place. But you can't really predict the market that well. So if your business is, is good, now it's about preparing the sale. And the sale part of it is 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 where people get it wrong. And I mean, the number of people who, who, who will think, okay, I'm ready to sell. I've got my financials ready. I'm ready. I've got, I've got what someone's going to want to see. Well, firstly, financials are a terrible tool for selling a business. So you've got, to pick, you've got to package the business really accurately and really well. And yes, that may take longer for some businesses than others because maybe they're not focused. Maybe one's got to interrogate a business, almost, almost like a strategic exercise. And so how are, we going to, how are we going to present this business to the market so they get it? There's nothing worse than sending out a great bit of information to buyers and they come back and think, so what does this business really do? Yeah. So you can get that wrong in, in, in terms of just an information memorandum, information pack. Obviously, preparing to get the right people to the table, critical. But probably the part that I think we've developed a lot over the last, you know, last few years is getting the, the data behind the marketing materials right. And we always we, we say, you know, in the end, we're, we're a sales and marketing business. We, we sell the business. We don't just put it out there and hope for the best. We, we actively promote it and sell it. But once you've had that first engagement, and we have we've quite exciting first meetings with 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 buyers, um, 
they, they're exciting because we often change the thinking about and this, in another example of preparation is how should you speak to a buyer in that first engagement? Well, the first thing is you shouldn't. You should get them to speak to you. So a little trick about how to manage a, a manager buyer at the table. But when that, and then obviously you get to a point where you share a lot about the business, you talk a lot about it, and then you say, cool, you know, it's, if you're interested, we'd like you to uh, make an offer. And what we do is we then open up a virtual data room for them to, to kind of prepare. What is in that, root, that data room is absolutely critical. And it's a massive part of the preparation you've got to do. Because that, firstly, that must match in one form or another what you put out in your marketing, mark, marketing materials. It must be much more in-depth. It must give all the detail of what someone's going to need to make an offer. And I tell you, there's nothing worse than someone making an offer and then you discover that they weren't looking at the, they had the wrong information. And um, so you can't t- tie someone to one hand behind their back and then destroying it. trust. But also, and Andrew, you've said it on my show. Sorry, Mark, I, told you, I think you froze for a second. Up here again. So good? Yeah. Okay. Well, I seem to be back again. Sorry about this. Um, <laughs> I'm on Irish fiber. Would you believe it? Uh, but you've you've said, Andrew, on the show several times that deal fatigue can creep in because mm. of the the intense preparation um, mm. and, and also then going into that due diligence. Over to you, over to you Andrew. No, it's all good. I'll pick it up. Look, it does. And I think, you know, a lot of business owners, you, you run in your business um, and the thought of, you know, this this long process taking place. I think, Michael, you know, to go back to your question, it, it does set in. I think where it sets in is where um, it's quite loose. Information isn't readily available. The, the, the incorrect preparation, you know, has been uh, has or hasn't been done. And, yeah, it, it is tough. It is a long, drawn-out process. But, you know, at, at least... I think it's it's a fatigue based on a on calculated activity versus being blindsided. And I think that's an important part. At least if you've got the prep, you, you're on top of all the moving parts and hopefully you're confident enough to deal with with most of the questions and the likes. I think it's when you do do some prep and it's okay, you then go through the process and then you get into an offer and due diligence. And then, you know, a lot of when we we talk to a lot of other advisors or business owners, and then they say the real work starts like that's dangerous because if the real work is only starting, then you haven't done your prep properly. So yeah, and then then fatigue, you know, fit, fatigue is you know is is a big issue. But it's it also comes down to that you know that example you used about if you're five years away, whatever it is, it's managing the expectation on traditionally how long does this take. So um, yeah, but it's but like I said earlier, and I think more and more, like Rick said, the data that underpins what you put out there uh, needs to be robust, accurate, and up to date, and that that builds trust quite quickly between a buyer and a seller, and then it you know, kind of is, is lubrication to hopefully the the cogs that create an engine for for the combined business. Yeah. Uh, and on that point, and I do apologise, I don't know what's going on with the internet here. Finding the right buyer is is really part of your skill set as well because you build obviously trust um by by having this database of buyers that, that you know and that you can connect with potential sellers and the last thing you want to do is be eroding that trust with those buyers as well so how, how do you find the right buyer maybe you can just lift the lid and the hood on you know how you as deal leaders have developed a, a database of potential buyers because it's not just local it, it's a global network that you bring to the table should Rick, I, do you want to take it first? And I'll, I'll add you. Yeah, it's, my, it's my favorite topic. I have to. I have to take. I can't steal Rick's thunder. You can't steal my thunder. <laughs> and it, 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 it's amazing, and maybe it's my engineering background how you can bring science into something which most people rely on pure gut feel to deliver on. And yeah. and, and and it does come down to basically it comes down to three key questions one's got to ask. And um, when you when you were saying, hey, where am I going to find the right buy? And you know, and and you know, there's so many out there. I mean, it's particularly when you go internationally. I mean, there are millions of buyers out there. So the, the the first question, fairly simple, is in whose hands is my business more valuable than my own hands? Because remember, find, your money is a very poor qualifier for a buyer. So you've got to put money aside for now. It's a it's a poor qualifier. In in whose hands is my business naturally more 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 valuable? A, a client base a location, something like that. The second question is, who sells non-competing products to my client base? It's a very critical one. And there are a couple of things in there. The first one is non-competing. 
Selling to a competitor is a very tough journey. It's not an easy journey to to go and to speak to. And you know, we 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 often try it. It kind of goes pear shaped on day one because you don't want to share enough information with a competitor. So the chance of them making a good offer are kind of small because they didn't get the right information in the first place. And it's just it's just got hurdles and problems and potholes all the way down that road. So non-competing, but still at the same factory gate. So when your sales guy's going into a particular factory, who's walking out? And picture it that way to who when you know go get the factory of your of, of your customer. Who else is physically there? And that's that's huge for finding complementary pro, um, complementary products, complementary customer base. And often you will find the party that's maybe a bit smaller, but got a serious growth um, trajectory and plan around your particular sector. And that's extremely powerful. So massive, massively important question to ask. And the third question is one that we've really believed that we've mastered a lot more of over the last number of years. And that is, once you've done that work and you've got this kind of big number of, of potential buyers out there, who are the shareholders of those potential buyers that you've identified, those businesses you've identified? Because shareholders, first is where the money sits. And often it's yeah. where it, the acquisitive strategies lie. You know, sure, in a very big listed company, there, there's a big overlap between shareholders and, and, and management. And, and yes, there might well be an M&A part of that, of that bigger organization. But in many of the buyers we speak to, they're separate entities, the shareholders from the, from the operators. And the shareholders are the ones that are very much driven. Well, you've got to find the ones who are driven by acquisitions. They're far more likely to think about synergies. They're likely to think about kind of value that they can bring. They, look, they will look for portfolio synergies rather than just form of private equity to many business owners out there but there's a massive difference between private equity and private equity you've got to know the difference but the private equity with a portfolio building up with a portfolio mindset almost like an investment holding company that's where you've got a, a, an acquisitive strategy and a synergistic um, portfolio so you know those three questions to me really drive that finding the right buyer yeah, and um, uh, when you look at the finding the right buyer, you, you need to find someone who understands the niche. If you look at Terracore, Lucidi, drilling, uh, drilling, you had players that were very specialized. But how do you then assess the cultural fit, especially when dealing with overseas buyers? And, and Prima, you know, springs to mind here. Um, it's one thing ticking um, all of the other boxes, but bringing an international acquirer into acquiring a, a, a South African asset, how, how does that go? Is it just lots of golf, wine, uh, bries, yeah. and, and getting to know each other? It's, it's less of the golf and the wine. It really is just engaging conversations. You know, we, as I said, said earlier, we have this first engagement as a meeting, and it's pretty much a meeting of the minds, but already you can sense the chemistry. And because both parties are asking each other about their history, why, how they got to where they are, what they're doing. Um, and you quite quickly pick up whether there's, there's the same way of talking, even the same way of engaging. I mean, that, you know, in the, with the, the guys from Chile, obviously quite different, you know, first language Spanish versus uh, you know, our guys, first language English, et cetera, et cetera. But you could quite, pick, you know, even their, their kind of philosophies, their family owned businesses, those kind of things. We very quickly saw that there was a, was it was a chemistry between them. So the other thing that's important in our world, and I think it's something that we pride ourselves on as advisors, is not to get in the way of the relationship. You know, I think some advisors feel like they must keep the two parties separate while they kind of work in between the two. But it is really critical to, to facilitate the engagement between the parties so that they build that trust. You know, Andrew's got a great term, collaborative trust. If you can build that collaborative trust, those cultural things take care of themselves. I don't know, Andrew, if you want to add to that. No, it's absolutely right. You know, I think uh, yeah, I, often, you know, for those, uh, I suppose, buyers on, you know, on this webinar as well, when you go through a process, you have very limited exposure to the selling shareholders. So, yeah, that ability to create that rapport and, and yeah, exposure, you know, getting people in front of each other and, and seeing how you collectively tackle obstacles and challenges and roadblocks is a is a really really good indication but you know the cultural differences can be real um and i think you know it's it's really important for any business owner if you are being approached by somebody or whatever it may be and they've acquired other businesses it's really critical to do your own due diligence in the other direction to understand what are these people like working with because you know those elements can be very very 
uh, important to what that final decision is you know, going to look like. I want to move on to point five, just being mindful of time here, yeah. in, in that in m a the phrase sell the future often pops up and rings true, because ultimately what you're also trying to sell are uh, expectations or estimations on, on the future things. And that can be a bit tricky. So I don't know who wants to pick up on this one, but how can a seller best package the growth and the potential of their business to attract top offers? The, the, the real trick is, you know, you ask any buyer, will you pay for the future? They'll say, no, I'm paying for the, the, the current and the past. So how do you get them there? The, the, firstly, there's got to be an opportunity for them. You never, you don't sell a business to someone who thinks they can continue growth at 5 to 10%. You only sell a business successfully to somebody who thinks they can double the business in the next two to three years. So there's got to be a big opportunity for the right buyer. Otherwise, it's going to come down to kind of financial numbers. But once you find the right guys and now you want to get the best deal and get them to pay for some of the future, we use what we call deal heat. Deal heat is about we've got 100 people we want to engage with. Let's engage with them within two to three weeks. And let's then have another maybe three weeks to have meetings with them so that we get all our offers in a in, in, over a very similar period, over maybe two to three week period. And we've got everyone at the table at the same time. And then what you generate out of the buyer is that there's a cost of buying this business, but what are the costs of missing out? And that, that cost drives them to potentially pay a bit more than they might have, but just to be sure that they, they're paying for the full value to them of that business rather than just the value that's on a piece of paper. So Andrew, I stole your thumb. I'm sure you could have had it. You know, it's a different angle, you know, and I think it's, you know, for most people on this call, you know, you, when you look at a forecast, it's it's an Excel spreadsheet, you know, and I think we, we've we had hundreds of conversations where a business is doing okay, and then now they want to sell, and there's this huge hockey stick effect, you know, and, and you know, expecting to be paid on that. And and I think the the a lot of what we've developed is the ability, you know, one is how do you sell the future, but more importantly, how do you prove it? So, you know, and I think so there's there's a lot that a business owner needs to do if they're not doing it now. And there's a lot of almost industry research, macro trends and the likes to support, you know, a, a, you know, kind of a, if you're going to extrapolate, you know, what what these trajectories look like. And, you know, you asked earlier, what are those elements in in preparation? You know, a simple mechanism like a budget and your accuracy on hitting your budgets. That sounds so basic and simple, but if you've got a really good track record and now you've budgeted for something else, there's something to go back, back to. But that that simplifies it. Obviously, there's many layers to it, um, but it is critical. You know, you've got to uh, getting somebody to pay for the future is a combination of the right process, the right buyers at the table, and the right data and information. Um, so it's kind of that triangle that that generally gets somebody there. Mm -hmm. Let's just wrap it up, Rick, with, with the last point here in this process before we talk about what you're seeing in the market currently and um, some structuring and then we'll go into some questions which have been coming in. So please keep your questions coming into the Q&A uh, chat function. Let's just talk about looking beyond the obvious. And you did mention you know, a good place to often start is to see where you, you, your, your non-competing players are, are dealing with your customers and who's walking through the gate. But maybe the right buyers from a completely different sector altogether so how does one go about looking beyond the obvious um, but when, it, when often it can be quite, quite lateral? You know, where do you even start? It, it is quite lateral. And I think most of our problem is making our list shorter, not, not longer, um, because of that yeah. e e e problem. So you've got to look out the overseas, and you've got, to, you've got to look overseas, particularly once you pass almost a kind of maybe $2 million mark of EBITDA. You, you know, then you, 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 your, your, your world just gets way bigger um, in terms of, of finding that international buyer. Um, so, yeah, they, they go together. You know, looking beyond the obvious and looking overseas are, are critical. Um, they really go to those three questions, though, and those three questions very quickly get you into space and say, wow, do you think someone doing this would buy that? You know, it, it, and, and as I say, sometimes we get too creative and we've got to pull ourselves back from that. But we, we do a lot of brainstorming around this to, to make sure we're not missing an opportunity somewhere. And definitely, you know, in the primer case, we, we worked hard on that. It wasn't obvious because we didn't really think, you know, initially, when you, know, when you initially look at it, you don't really think that they're going to be the buyer, particularly because one of their competitors was one of the biggest clients of, of primer. 
And um, so, the, you know, there was really a conflict that didn't really make sense. But you've just got to keep looking under those rocks until you find the right, the, you know, the right opportunity. So let's just build on that a little bit further then, Rick. What made sense in that deal? What, what was it that um, eventually saw the light bulb come on and um, in, in yeah. your, your mind say, this is the right buyer? But I think from our from our perspective, it actually it, it wasn't so much that because we only knew it was the right buy once we had spoken to them. It was that refusing to stop before we had looked <laughs> everywhere. In fact, our client had even said, "No, we don't think we should approach them because they compete with our biggest client." So you know there was already a resistance, and we had to convince them that you've got to go and look there. You've got to look there. You've got to look there. You've got to look in these different countries and different regions around the world, um, in order to be sure that you've covered it all in case. In this particular case of the prime acquirer, firstly, in their very first presentation to us, when we first met them online, um, they presented their world map of all the dots around the world where they are. And there was one very lonely little dot in Zambia. That's the only dot in the whole of Africa, one of the biggest mining regions in the world. And they had one tiny little dot in Zambia. You know, from, from that moment, I remember going back to Andrew and saying, wow, and he's experienced this once before. I said, I've see, experienced the same thing. They've got to be the buyer. They need to be here. Um, but you, you, we didn't even pick that up from the research. We picked that up from them explaining it to us. So again, get the buyer to talk first. You're going to find some amazing things when you get them to talk first, because you can you can play to that and and help you put your energy where it needs to go. You can't have you know a two hour conversation with a hundred people. Mm. Great bit of insight that. Um, uh, Andrew, I don't know if you just want to build on that point before we wrap up uh, on our six points. Yeah, look, uh, you know, there's those three questions then lead to another three questions, and and it's 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 an iterative process. And yeah, I think a thorough understanding of also what's happening in the market and transactions and market intelligence and the likes, because yeah, you know, there's there's so many layers to it, and you know, it's it's probably quite easy. We've dealt with a number of of other advisors or business owners that you know, have got a list of who they think is going to buy their business. And most of the time it's, it's not, it's not accurate or successful because it is a big world out there. Um, uh. And yeah, you know, so, so it is about looking under every rock um, but also understanding, you know, there's a lot of creative deals out there. You've got to go and mine them. And I suppose that's where technology and AI and the like starting to help as well. Um, but yes, you know, if you look at our process, probably the biggest chunk of time is spent on this very thing. And, you know, when you go through it and you see the results, you can understand why, you know, so but yeah, it's yeah, critical. Yeah. And, and like Rick said, you know, probably one, one of our strongest capabilities that we've been fortunate enough to build over the years. Well, there we go. Avoid passivity. You, choice is king. Undoubtedly, be well prepared. Um, find the right buyer and then sell the future and align to that uh, look beyond the obvious as well. Uh, if we zoom out and, and um, talk about the current market dynamics, Rick, um, we see that 41% of your deals have been in the 100 million to 300 million rand range, with 16% over 300 million, which means you're dealing with some significant transactions. W what trends are you seeing in deal structures for, for these high value exits? And how do elements like cash up front or or earnouts come into play. You mentioned earlier that you don't, you really don't like earnouts. Are, are you are you seeing that um, as a as a condition precedent to to the transaction? What are the trends that you see? Sure, there, there, there are many trends. So maybe firstly, from a sector trend, there's no doubt that we are seeing a lot of activity in this kind of mining services sector broadly. So you know that yeah. that, that I, I reckon that power related businesses and. Um, and probably the you know the kind of technology space is always very active, but those are really the, the areas that we're seeing a lot of a, a lot a lot of activity. I think that um, yeah, to to the structures, so many deals. There are many people. If you spoke to someone in South Africa, particularly if they've done a deal, they're going to and you're going to say what kind of structures? They're going to say you can't do a deal without an earnout. An earnout is basically where the price is pretty much determined. Maybe you get fifty percent or thirty three percent up front. And you only get the balance based on hitting certain targets. And a lot of people get convinced that this is the only way you can do it. And of course, the buyer says, but you know, these are your, they're your targets. So you should be fine. You know, that, that, you know it, it's, it's fairly obvious that you know, you're going to hit them because we're not going to get in the way. Firstly, they do get in the way. And very big targets aren't missed because there's too much distraction. And a lot of, there are a lot of horror stories of people only literally receiving the kind of zero risk portion of that. 
what we found is mostly because of that process of deal heat, getting the best deal out of the, the buyers right up front and the, in their first offer, we just see a lot fewer earnouts. And we very, very seldom close deals on these kind of earnout structures. And um, because there are alternatives, there are alternatives involving not selling all your shares. Um, there are inter- alternatives involving maybe um, some very basic re- achievements, like you know, revenue doesn't go down, those type of things, fairly high level things, which um, which can replace the earnout. You know, the, an earnout is basically a world where a buyer is trying to push their risk onto the seller. Yeah, um, yeah. and there are other ways. Maybe to just cover one or two of those, which is also very. Uh, a part, that, a part of deals that scares the hell out of them is warranties. So a very detailed due diligence is another way that a buyer reduces risk. And then, of course, warranties is one of them as well. Warranties are, again, they're a bit of a swear word to most sellers, and so it's always worth covering them. But just you know, what sellers need to remember is that warranties don't change the risk. The risk was there anyway. But they certainly focus on the risk to the seller post-transaction. And it's certainly a, it's something to have a good, solid conversation about before one engages the market. Say, what would you be worried about signing a warranty against if we went forward with the transaction? And managing it quite early on from almost, almost an emotional perspective, because it's probably the biggest hurdle that most sellers go through. Once you've got past the structures that people don't like, so you've got to manage the structure out, the warranty is going to hit you at some point. And one of the ways to reduce warranties is by business sale rather than, than company sell, but that often comes with tax implications. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Yeah, but obviously lots to unpack around that. Let's go into some questions here. We've got, I think this is from Tinas. I'm not 100% sure though, because we're trying to copy and paste. Um, what have you found are the, uh, is the typical deal duration? And also how often is it required that previous owners are expected to remain on in the company after the transaction? Um, uh, Andrew, I don't know if you want to pick mm. up on that. Yeah, look, I, I would say that that if you're looking at running a, a successful process, of, um, you're probably looking at a, about twelve to fourteen months. It depends on the size of your business, depends on the buyer, and, and I, the reason why that's important is to understand whether there's going to be a competition commission uh, implication. I think the the question mark around needing to stay on also is driven by how involved are you in the business and do you have succession or a strong management team and, and the likes. The rule of thumb is, is most business owners are going to be expected to stay on. What that duration mm-hmm. looks like goes back to the earlier points I made. If you have none of the above, I would say, you know, if you, it's a, a relatively simple business to run and the buyer has got depth and resources or, you know, they're going to divisionalize it or whatever it may be, you, you would never, I don't know, in our experience, see anything less than a year. Um, but but more realistically, two to three years um, is, is probably more an accurate rule of thumb these days. And um, there are quite a few coming through that I'm mm. mindful of the time I want to get through. So Hari already asks, do you have presence in Australia for M&A activity of mineral property? Uh, we've got partners in Australia, um, but but again, on if it's if it's direct mining assets, it's it's one industry direct mining. We we don't have the skill set for, and we choose not to to play this. And maybe if we we could pick up something offline and and understand a bit more about the opportunity. Right. Um, a follow up from Luke Govender. What is Deal Leader's approach to acquiring a company in business rescue? Acquiring or yeah. Or advising, so, I would imagine mm. advising someone on acquiring a, a business out of mm. business rescue. Yeah, I think that you know, it, it, so what I was going to add to the whole timeline story is time, time is, a, is a major factor in deal making. And um, on the one hand, time generally taking too long over things kills deals because there's just too many factors getting in the way. And, you know, so so doing deals quickly is 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 really important. And um, I think we're in our, almost a record now where someone who started with us in in April. Um, got to final sort of offer agreement um, at the end of September, and um, so it was you know that, that that that's about as fast as you can get there. And then of course you go into more your DD and closing. But they should close in about eight or nine months. And um, the problem with the business rescue is you don't have a lot of time, and um, you don't have time to really get into the detail of it. So yeah, you know, I would I would recommend if one was looking at um, at buying a business out of business rescues, know that sector, know that industry well. And also, probably the biggest advantage of buying out of business rescue is to choose your assets. Um, yeah. You know, and the, yeah. the example of you know the Edcon Group was it um, one of the Metier businesses that 
that, that acquired um, the Edgar stores, they only chose the good ones. They didn't mm. cho- choose the bad ones. So, so I think the real trick to buying out business rescue is choose, look at that balance sheet carefully and choose which of the assets on that balance sheet you really want and preferably you know, yeah. know the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, I think there are a few more questions. Hopefully we can get to them um, directly uh, after this. Uh, but being mindful of time, with just a minute to go, I've got to wrap it up there. Rick, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, great discussion on the art of the exit. Uh, clear, um, clearly, uh, it's more than just a process of sitting down and you know coming up with a number in your head. It, it really is something that is that is complex, that you, you need good advice uh, in order to be able to uh, assure yourself of, of the right process at the end of the day. So to all of our attendees, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave you with this m a mantra. You only get one shot at this, so make it count. I'm going to hand over to uh, Shannon now, who's going to wrap everything up. Thanks so much, um, Michael. That brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you to Michael Avery, Rick Grantham, and Andrew Bowman for their input into the discussion. I, for one, found it very interesting, and I hope that the attendees also enjoyed it. We thank you all for taking the time to join this discussion on strategies for maximizing your business's appeal to buyers. If you're interested in hearing more about Deal Leaders International, please visit their website at www.dealleadersint.com. At Deal Leaders International, they recognize the unique needs of both smaller and larger businesses. To effectively address these differences, they have two specialized divisions, each dedicated to serving one of these distinct segments. Both divisions are led by highly experienced professionals. So that leaves us with the recording of today's webinar, which will be made available to all the stakeholders. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. We thank you so much for your time and goodbye.